In this series of videos, we will read the Care Certificate Workbooks, both what you need to know and what do you know now. This video covers Standard 15, Infection Prevention and Control, what you need to know, and it's over to my colleague to read through this workbook. The Care Certificate, Infection Prevention and Control, what you need to know, Standard 15, the Care Certificate Workbook. Infection Prevention and Control. Infection and infectious diseases in humans are caused when harmful germs known as pathogens or pathogenic microorganisms enter the body and grow. These microorganisms are so small they can only be seen using a microscope. Infectious diseases, unlike other diseases such as heart disease and diabetes, can spread from person to person. As with all illnesses, prevention is better than cure. Following agreed ways of working that stop the spread of pathogens can help prevent and control infection. Pathogens. A pathogen is something that causes a disease. Pathogenic organisms can be bacteria. Bacteria that can multiply quickly at body temperature and reach harmful levels very fast. Examples of harmful bacteria include MRSA and C. diff. These two types of bacteria caused or contributed to 9,000 deaths in hospital or primary care in 2007. Viruses. These can survive on surfaces and in food, but can multiply only in living cells. It takes very few virus organisms to cause illness. They can be spread from person to person and from environment to food. Examples of viruses include winter vomiting, influenza or the flu virus. Fungi are organisms, organisms which live on hosts. They can be alive or dead. Examples of fungal infections include athlete's foot and ringworm. Parasites live on or in animal or plant, known as a host. Scabies is caused by mites that burrow into the skin, causing severe itching. Protozoa are single cells organisms that live in water and damp conditions. For example, malaria. Hosts. A host could describe an organism from which the parasite feeds or in which it lives and grows. Some groups of people may be more vulnerable to infection, for example, because of the age or general health or some particular illness. If these groups become infected, the symptoms may be serious and life-threatening. If the microorganisms which cause the illness are resistant to antibiotics, it could be difficult to treat the illness. And then here we have the chain of infection. In order for the spread of infectious diseases to take place, the chain of infection must be completed. And then we have here, and then we can see that it goes round. So we have the cause agent, the pathogenic organism, the reservoir or source, means of exit, the way out of the body, mode of transmission, method of spread, portal of entry, the way into the body, and person at risk. The first link in the chain is a causative agent. This is the harmful germ or pathogen that can cause infection, illness and disease. Examples include bacteria and viruses. The second link is the reservoir source. This is where pathogens live and multiply. Remember that you could be in or on a person or animal, host, or in the soil, water or food. The third link is the means of exit. This is how pathogens leave the source. For example, pathogens that live in the respiratory tract, the lungs and throat, can leave the body through the mouth, nose, in saliva or mucus when coughing and sneezing. Other examples of means of exit are broken skin, mucous membranes such as eyes, via the stomach and via the intestines and anus. The fourth link is the mode of transmission. It refers to how the pathogen is passed from one person to another. Contact transmission is the most common route of transmission of pathogens in health and social care workplace. This can happen by direct contact, such as hand-to-hand, -hand, or indirect contact via objects such as equipment. Pathogens such as those that cause influenza and chickenpox can stay in the air for a long time and be breathed in by other people. The fifth link is the portal of entry. This is the way the pathogen enters the body of the potential host. Pathogens can enter the body by coming into contact with broken skin, being breathed in or eaten, coming into contact with the eyes, nose and mouth, or, for example, when needles or catheters are inserted. The sixth and final link in the chain is a person at risk. A person at risk is the individual the pathogen moves to. The risk of person 
Becoming infected depends on the factors as their general health and their strength of their immune system, which is the body's system for fighting germs and microorganisms. Breaking the chain. Preventing infection means breaking the links in the chain so that infection cannot spread. Some links are easier to break than others. For example, it is easier to stop a pathogen from entering a person than it is to stop one leaving an infected person. The steps taken to protect individuals and workers from infection are an important part of providing high quality care and support. It is vital to remember that not everybody who carries harmful microorganisms will be ill or show any symptoms. So you must work in a way to prevent infection at all times. Standard precautions are the actions that should be taken in every situation to reduce the risk of infection. These include good hand hygiene, safe disposal of waste, safe management of laundry, correct use of personal protective equipment, PPE. In a workplace, it may be necessary to take additional measures when supporting people who are known to be carrying some harmful microorganisms to protect others from contamination. This can be particularly important if the pathogens travel through air. Contamination. A thing is contaminated if it is dirty, infected, polluted or it has gone off. Your health and hygiene. You have an important role to play in preventing the spread of infections. It is your responsibility to keep up to date with your own vaccinations in line with the UK vaccination schedule as it is part of your duty to protect the individual. You can transmit them to people who you support directly or you can transfer them to other people or equipment if you do not follow the correct hygiene procedures. Illness. If you have a cold or flu symptom, such as a runny nose, an upset stomach or skin infections, you should speak to your manager before reporting to work. If you have diarrhea or vomiting, you should not attend work until you've been free from symptoms for 48 hours. Clothing. Your clothing can become contaminated with harmful micro microorganisms. Disposable aprons and over sleeves should be used when handling anything contaminated with body fluids to protect clothes from contamination. Changing your clothing daily reduces the risk of remaining contaminants being spread from individuals you support. Uniforms or work clothing should be washed on a hot wash, then tumble dried or ironed hot to kill any bacteria present. Personal hygiene. Personal hygiene is extremely important for people who take care of others. Daily washing, showering or bathing will remove most of the microorganisms from your skin. Hand hygiene is also extremely important. Fingernails should be kept short, rings apart from a plain wedding band, wristwatches or bracelets should not be worn as they can make hand washing less effective. Skin health. Microorganisms can live on the skin. The number of pathogens increases when the skin is damaged. All cuts should be covered with waterproof dressings. Using hand cream, good quality paper towels and soaps. Good hand habits. Having good hand habits means not touching areas that can be a source of pathogens more than you need to. These include your nose, hair and mouth, and not biting your nails. This also applies to work practices such as using foot-operated bins rather than lifting the lids with hands. Hand washing is an area of your competence that is essential to ensure health and well-being of yourself, the individuals and all others you support. Five moments for hand hygiene. Hand hygiene is an important part of preventing infection. Hands can be cleaned or decontaminated by washing with water and soap that removes dirt and germs from the hands but doesn't kill them, using alcohol rubs and gels which kill most bacteria. If hands are visibly dirty, these rubs and gels will be less effective against C. diff and some of the viruses that cause vomiting and diarrhea. The World Health Organization has identified five moments when health and social care workers should clean their hands. These moments are before touching the individual you are supporting, immediately before carrying out a clean procedure, after exposure to bodily fluids and removing gloves, after touching the individual you are supporting, after touching the area or objects surrounding the individual you are supporting, hand washing. For hand washing to be effective, it is important that you make sure every part of your hands are carefully washed, rinsed and dried. The steps below show how to ensure that your hands are washed correctly. First, wet your hands and wrists thoroughly using warm running water. Apply liquid or foam soap. Produce a good lather by rubbing your palms together, then interlock your fingers and rub together again. 
Rub the palm of your hand, ensuring the fingertips and fingernails are cleaned. Ensure that the backs of your hands are lathered and cleaned. Rub with your fingers. In, rub your fingers locked, maintaining a good lather. Ensuring your wrists are cleaned. Rinse your hands thoroughly using water. Hands and wrists should be thoroughly dried using paper towels or a hand dryer. And turn off the tap with a paper towel. Rubbing and lathering your hands should take around 20 seconds. Personal Protective Equipment PPE Your employee must provide you with the equipment you need to protect you from injury and, as far as possible, from the risk of infection while you are at work. That includes enough uniforms for regularly changing and disposable aprons to protect clothing and uniforms from contamination from blood and bodily fluids, skin protecting paper towels and soaps and hand cleansing gels or wipes, the correct type of gloves to reduce the risk of cross-contamination of you and individuals you are supporting, masks and respiratory masks to protect you from breathing in harmful microorganisms, goggles, eye protection, face shields if there is a risk of being splashed by bodily fluids. It is also important that you appreciate the seriously consider any vaccinations your employee might have on offer as part of prevention or infectious spreading. One example might be your vaccine against influenza or flu. Safe handling of waste. It is important that you understand how different waste should be handled safely to protect you and your colleagues and the people that you provide support for. Clinical waste is produced from healthcare and similar activities. It is placed in either yellow or orange plastic sacks. It should be kept separate from other waste and disposed of using specialist facilities. Clinical waste can either be hazardous, waste that poses or might pose a risk of infection, for example, pads and dressing, or non-hazardous, which is non-infectious waste. Waste containers should be handled carefully to avoid contamination. Where appropriate, you should use PPE to protect you from contamination and infection. Your employee should have a waste handling policy in place. This will detail how you should deal with different types of waste. You must make sure that you understand and follow the policy at all times. Safe disposal of sharps. Your employee is responsible for providing the correct equipment and materials to reduce the risk of injury. They are also responsible for managing the risks and using sharps such as needles and blades. Undertaking risk assessments where necessary, the following guidelines in relation to sharps should be followed. They must be disposed of at the point of use and in approved containers. All sharps bins should have the name of the person who assembled it and the date of assembly on the label. The same applies for the person closing the bins. Do not fill bins past the full line mark. Sharps can fall out and cause injury. Use the temporary cloth not in use. This will prevent spillages if the bin is toppled over. Always keep bins above floor level to prevent children from reaching them. Store bins securely out of sight and reach of other people who may be present if workers are transporting sharps by car. These should be kept in the car boot. Do not pass sharps from one hand to the other. Do not handle sharps more than essential. Do not put protective covering back onto needles. Do not bend or break needles. Do not separate needles or syringes before disposal. Soiled linen. Linen that comes into contact with workers or individuals can become contaminated with harmful microorganisms and bodily fluids. Linen refers to anything that is made of cloth, including bedding, towels and clothing. Personal protective equipment, PPE, must be shown must be worn when handling infected linen as it can transfer pathogens to the skin and clothing. All infected linen that is linen contaminated with bodily fluids must be washed separately from other items. Clothing can be decontaminated at 40 to 50 degrees washed by tumble drying and by hot ironing. Bedding and towels should be washed in a hot wash to ensure that bacteria are killed. Laundry should be moved to the washing area in sealed, colour-coded bags. When supporting an individual in their own home, you should ask permission to wash infected linen immediately. Once linen has become decontaminated, it must be stored separately from contaminated linen to prevent, to prevent cross contamination. You must always follow your agreed ways of working. If you have any questions, you should ask these to your manager. Agreed ways of working. 
Agreed ways of working are the organisation's policies and procedures. This includes the less formally documented by individual employees and the self-employed, as well as formal practices such as the Dignity Code, Essence of Care and Compassion in Practice. Great work on finishing this What You Need to Know booklet. In this series, we also have the What You Need to Know activity booklet that follows on from this video.